Today's lesson is about absolute monarchies in Europe. We'll be exploring the question, how did the rise of absolute rulers shape governments in Europe? So our goals in today's lesson is to learn about absolutism in Europe. And by the end of the lesson, we'll be able to do three things. First, we'll be able to describe the characteristics of absolutism. Second, we'll be able to identify characteristics of absolute rule in Spain, France, and Russia. Finally, we'll be able to explain how absolute rulers changed government. Now, throughout this lesson, you're going to hear some key vocabulary terms. Now, these words to know fall into two categories. We've got an academic word um, that you might hear about in other lessons or other disciplines, and then four kind of key words that are focused in this lesson. Now, at any time, if you need to review these words or you want to refresh the definition, just go ahead and click on that word, and a glossary will help you out. So in today's lesson, we're studying absolutism in Europe during the 15 and 1600s. And we'll particularly look at two case studies, Louis XIV of France and Peter the Great of Russia in order to get a better understanding of how absolute rule was in Europe during this time. Now, by the end of today's lesson, we'll be able to answer the question, how did the rise of absolute rulers shape governments in Europe? So a few things happened to create tremendous change in Europe in the 15 and 1600s. One, we see something called the Reformation, and we'll talk more about the Reformation a little bit later on in this lesson, but that leads to a decline, actually, in the power of the church. And some religious unrest leads to kind of uncertainty amongst the people, and finally, competition amongst European nations to create empires in the Americas, through trade routes, all combine to see monarchs seizing power. And so we'll talk about how all these things kind of come together throughout this lesson. Now, by understanding the rule of Louis XIV and Peter the Great, we'll have a better idea of how absolutism in Europe unfolded during the 15 and 1600s. And again, by the end of today's lesson, we'll be able to answer this question, how did the rise of absolute rulers shape governments in Europe? So absolute rule is not new by the 15 and 1600s in Europe. It had been used hundreds of years previously by Augustus Caesar in the Roman Empire, but it really starts to make its resurgence in the 15 and 1600s in Europe. And in an absolute monarchy, a king or a queen holds unlimited power. They answer to no law or no person. Now this is because they believe in this principle of a divine right, this idea that God has bestowed the right to rule upon them. Now maybe we can see no better example of, of this ideology than in the quote that's on the screen here by Louis XIV where he says, I am the state. He is basically trying to uphold his significance as being the absolute highest power in the state of France. Now let's move on to look at how absolute monarchies really develop. As early as 1527, Philip II of Spain, he's one of our earliest examples of absolute rulers in this time. He is the son of Charles V. Now, Charles V was the Holy Roman Emperor. He had clashed with the, uh, the Lutherans in Germany uh, earlier than this. And Philip is responsible for kind of taking his father's lead and growing the Spanish Empire to its greatest size and power. And he did that by enacting kind of four key principles uh, in this absolute rule. He built a large standing army. Now this is one of the first times that kings are building a permanent army. Previously they were only building armies in times of war. He also supported something called the Counter-Reformation. This was a time when he was trying to impose the Catholic religion on the people of Spain and the neighboring countries. He even went so far as to attempt to invade England using an armada, a Spanish fleet of ships. Now this was ultimately unsuccessful, but it proved that he was willing to try to push these boundaries. And then finally, he tries to raise taxes. Now this was particularly unpopular in the Spanish Netherlands. And so as we move on to look at kind of how Philip II is looking at this, this unlimited power that he has, we can see that all of these ideas are kind of connected. Now, first of all, he believes that God has given him this right of rule, this divine right. And he uses that to create this concept of unlimited power, 
which he believes allows him to build a permanent standing army. Now this means he's going to continually tax the Spanish people and the people of the countries that Spain is, is in charge of at this time. Now perhaps the most important thing that we should discuss when we're looking at uh, Philip II's reign is how he tried to control religious beliefs. He tried to impose the Catholic religion on the Netherlands, on England, and eventually this imposition led to the Spanish Inquisition. So in today's lesson, we're trying to answer this question, how did the rise of absolute rulers shape governments in Europe? Now, in studying absolutism in Europe, we're going to look at two case studies in particular. Louis XIV of France, who took office in 1643 at age five. Now, he rules for a very long period, well into his old age. Uh, we'll take another look at a case in, in Russia under Peter the Great, who takes the throne in 1696. And so we see that there's a very long period of this absolute rule in Europe. Now the religious wars of the 15 and 1600s in Europe saw rule kind of change in the continent in one of two ways. Now in some countries like England, we saw more power go into the hands of parliament, elected officials, and written law. But in other countries like France, more power started to go into the hands of the monarchy. Now let's take a look at why this happens. Um, there were four kind of key factors contributing to absolutism in France. First, there's no heritage of representative government or limited monarchies. So there was only a history of very powerful leaders in the country. Second, we saw that the monarchs were successful in crushing Protestant opposition to the Catholic Church. And so they thought that they might be successful in kind of sustaining this control over the people of the country as well. Next, this aristocracy, the noble people, they compromised with the monarchs to keep their privileges. They thought that they had more of a chance of keeping their wealth if they supported the king rather than the people. And they also saw a lot of freedom from taxes during this time. And finally, and perhaps most interestingly, is this concept that there were strong personalities ruling during this transition, and they really took advantage of their charisma. Now we're going to move on to review what we've learned so far. So Louis XIV is, by many historians, considered the ideal absolute monarch. And this is because he exemplifies many of these characteristics that we consider to be specific to absolute rule. Now he reigns for more than 70 years and that's because he takes the throne at age five when his father dies but because of his young age he has an assistant kind of help him out. Mazarin leads the country on his behalf until Mazarin dies in 1661 and at that point at the age of 23 Louis takes the throne fully on his own. Now he fancied himself the Sun King he saw himself as the center of the French universe. Now he used this belief to expand the power of the monarchy and he like many other absolute rulers believed in the divine right of rulers, this God-given right. Now we see that most of his support comes from the court surrounding him. So let's move on to see how that court supports him. One of his primary advisors, a Catholic bishop and court preacher who reported directly to Louis XIV, Jacques Benin Bousset, he said in 1678, rulers then act as the ministers of God and his lieutenants on earth. It is through them that God exercises his empire. Consequently, as we have seen, the royal throne is not the throne of a man, but the throne of God himself. Now it's important to break this down. When he uses this word lieutenants, he's basically saying that they are his assistants. They are God's assistants on earth. And when he goes on to say that the royal throne is not the throne of a man, but the throne of God himself, he's insinuating that a king is not on par with men. He is equivalent to God. Now, when we look at this quote, it's important to not only look at the words he uses, but what is his perspective? Why is he saying these words? And so his point of view is something that we should consider. Is there any bias in what he's saying? 
Now, when we're thinking about the bias, we have to consider what would be the alternative? If Bosue said that he disagreed with divine right, what could potentially happen to him? Now, what we're going to do as we move on is talk a little bit about how Louis XIV exercised his great rule, his great power. Louis XIV was known for many significant achievements, but perhaps best known for commissioning the Palace of Versailles. This sprawling, lavish 700-room palace was home not only to Louis and his family, but also the nobles who served under him. Now, he wanted the nobles to live at Versailles because this gave him an opportunity to keep an eye on them, to keep them in check, and prevent them from plotting against him. Now, because of the lavishness and the size of this palace, it did require thousands of servants, and it took about 25% of the French government's revenue each year just to sustain. Now, because he needed to constantly generate more and more money to support his lavish lifestyle, he needed to increase the power of the bureaucracy. He used royal civil servants people that were hired to support the court um, by collecting taxes from the people, by enacting justice to keep the population in check. Uh, and he finally modernized the army. He had the hopes of keeping his, his permanent standing army as strong as possible so that he could expand French territory. Now, clearly, Louis XIV is one of the most powerful kings as a result of, of, all of, uh, of all of these things that he did, but he had some shortcomings as well. Over time, he grew more and more isolated from the French people. People began to see him as out of touch with the common man. And because he encouraged the persecution of French Protestants, he revoked the Edict of Nantes, uh, we start to see religious conflict renewed. And then finally, because of his lavish lifestyle, because of the ongoing costly wars that he kept uh, pursuing, the monarchy was deeply in debt. And all of these things begin to kind of sow the seeds for the revolution that we'll see in France about 75 years after Louis' reign. So here are some of the characteristics of absolute rule in France under King Louis XIV. Now, like many absolute rulers, he did believe in his divine right to rule over the French people, that God has given him this right to do so. And so he creates a permanent standing army in order to try to wield this unlimited power, um, specifically to control religious beliefs. As a Catholic, he tries to impose that religion on all of the people of France. And because he has this kind of belief in his unlimited power, he tries to utilize a strong central government, a strong bureaucracy, a court that is going to support his rule indefinitely. How did the rise of absolute rulers shape governments in Europe? Now, to this point, we've had a chance to learn a little bit about Philip II of Spain and Louis XIV of France, two absolute rulers who used tax collection as an opportunity to build large standing armies and took the opportunity as divine rulers, God-given God rulers, to persecute non-Catholics. Now we're going to move on to look at how Russia and their version of absolute rule differed and compared to other European countries. Now, as Russia moves closer and closer to absolute rule in the late 17th century, it gives us an opportunity to compare what's happening in Russia at that time with what's happening in the rest of Europe. Now, throughout Europe, feudalism has been in decline since the 1400s, but in Russia, the feudal system lasts until the mid-1800s. Now, if you remember, the feudal system is a system in which we've got serfs or peasants that are working land, um, and they don't really have a whole lot of rights. They're very similar to the enslaved people of the Americas. And so this is a system that lasts well into the 19th century in Russia, so very different political systems uh, in the other parts of Europe. We also know that while in most of Europe these great advancements are being made during the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery, because most of the geography of Europe encouraged trade and the spread of new ideas. Now in Russia, they're kind of cut off from the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery because they're geographically isolated. 
Now, we also see big uh, religious differences between the two at this time. Europe, most of Europe anyway, is looking to Rome and the Catholic Church for leadership, while Russia is looking to Constantinople uh, for leadership. And the schism between the church happens actually in the mid-11th century. Um, so this has been going on for quite some time. Now, let's take a look at the leader who comes, comes of age during this time to be an absolute ruler. Uh, Peter the Great becomes the, the leader of Russia in 1696, and he's ultimately responsible for making Russia into a modern world power. Now, he travels across Western Europe as a young man, and this is what exposes him to all of these ideas that are spreading throughout most of uh, Europe at the time. And he decides he wants to enact this westernized reform in Russia, and so he exercises harsh, absolute power to achieve that reform. Now, as a ruler, Peter the Great establishes a strong central government, and we see this happening in France and in Spain as well at this time. Uh, one of the ways he was able to kind of centralize power into his own hands was by reducing the power of the boyars. The boyars were those high-ranking nobles, and you can see one of them in the, the image on the screen here. And take particular note of the long beard and the elaborate style of dress of the boyar. He also brings uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church under state control, so he is higher than even the church. And like the rulers in Spain and France, he's also building this large standing army um, in the hopes of expanding Russian territory. Okay. Now, the legacy of Peter the Great's rule uh, is one very similar to Louis XIV in that he's forcing his nobility to do everything according to his own decisions. Now, what he's doing is forcing his nobility to adopt Western customs. So if you remember the long beard, the elaborate, elaborate dress of the boyars, he's going to take that away from them, make them cut their beards and dress more simply. Um, he also starts a newspaper and translates many Western books into Russian, again in this attempt to reform the, the Russian system to make it more Westernized. Finally, he establishes a new capital at St. Petersburg. Now, St. Petersburg is, is right on the water, so he hopes that this is going to be a new trading post. He calls it uh, the Window on Europe. And part of the reason he called it that is because he wanted St. Petersburg to be the model for all of Russia in this westernization reform attempt. Now, absolute rule in Russia begins to take shape under Peter the Great in very similar ways as it did in Spain and France. One, Peter sees himself as having a divine, God-given right to control the Russian territory. And because he sees himself as having unlimited power, there are a few things he does to try to control the Russian country. One, just like Philip II and Louis XIV, he develops a permanent standing army to protect his monarchy. He also tries to control Russian culture through a westernization reform program. And he does this by enacting certain Western practices all over Russia, specifically in his bureaucracy. He forces nobles to cut their hair, change the way they dress. He also begins to promote lower ranking nobles who show undying loyalty to him. Now, we've had a chance to study not only Peter's reign, but also the reign of Philip and Louis in Spain and France. And so we'll take a moment to look at a timeline of how all of these leaders uh, developed in comparison to one another. So when we look at this timeline, we see that in 1556, Philip II becomes one of those early absolute rulers in Spain. Not so long after, about 100 years later, in France, Louis XIV is reigning for well over 70 years. Now, within about 50 years of Louis XIV's uh, throne, we see Peter the Great taking office in 1696. Now, these absolute rulers wanted to take not only control of their own countries, but they hoped to expand their territories. And so it's important to kind of look at how colonial expansion is happening around the same time as these uh, monarchs are taking their thrones. In 1540, before Philip II even became king, Spain's American empire is already well established. And by 1607, England's first colony was established in the Americas. 
And so we're going to continue talking about the expansion of, of these absolute rulers uh, as we move on here. Now, by understanding the rule of Louis XIV and Peter the Great, we'll have a better idea of how absolutism in Europe unfolded during the 15 and 1600s. And again, by the end of today's lesson, we'll be able to answer this question, how did the rise of absolute rulers shape governments in Europe?